Hi, I'm Michael Odie. I'm a SolarWinds contributor and president of Tekka Inc. And in this quick webcast, we're going to talk about avoiding some of the common SQL Server performance problems. When you look at performance in SQL Server, it is really, well, on the hardware side, three main pillars that go into SQL Server performance, and that is the CPU, memory, and the storage. But these things work together and they will have a big impact on performance for sure and we'll look at some of the ways they do that. But there are other areas as well. Certainly one of the key points that many people neglect are the system power and BIOS settings. We'll look at how you would set those for maximum SQL Server performance and then we'll dig into a few of the most important SQL Server configuration settings. Uh, the configuration for TempDB can have a big impact on performance. We'll also look at some of the best practices for some of the common SQL Server configuration settings. So when you talk about uh, hardware performance, with a CPU, faster is almost always better. But it's also to remember that today, processor performance and speed is kind of plateaued out. And nowadays, uh, Intel and uh, AMD, they are increasing CPU performance by adding cores. But more cores don't solve every problem. For instance, if your applications are single-threaded, they're only going to use a single core. Of course, the SQL Server database engine itself is multi-threaded, so it can take advantage of multiple cores. But it's also important to realize, especially if you're running in a server consolidation environment where you have a lot of virtual SQL Server systems, it's important not to overcommit the physical CPUs, at least if you're concerned about performance. You always want to have CPU power available for those virtual machines that are running. And with memory, memory is one of the biggest factors in uh, SQL Server performance, that's for sure. But more memory isn't always a silver bullet. If you have more memory in your system, that will help a memory constrained system without any doubts at all. However, more memory won't fix poorly written queries. It won't fix locking and latching kind of weights. So more memory isn't always the solution. But when you're checking into memory, there's a few uh, performance counters you should have a look at. First, there's the memory available counter. This shows you how much memory is available for use in your system. If you have some low values here, that could indicate that your system needs more memory. Next is the memory paging per second, and that indicates how many pages are written to disk due to faulting. Here, a high value will indicate a lack of memory. And then there's the buffer cache hit ratio. Uh, the, SQL Server uses the buffer cache to store results of queries in, and it will go to that buffer cache before it goes to disk, meaning it doesn't have to perform I.O. for a lot of operations. This is critical for performance. You definitely want your buffer cache hit ratio to be very high. Certainly above 90% is a, is a good value. If you have a, a lower value, that could definitely indicate that SQL Server can't grow the buffer cache as big as it needs to. You know, in today's system, storage is often the biggest bottleneck because you have high-powered CPUs and systems with lots of memory. Some of today's server systems can have up to 24 terabytes of RAM. That's an incredible amount. So storage sometimes, especially if you're connected to an older storage subsystem, it can be the bottleneck. A couple counters to look at when you're checking out storage is your physical disk object and looking at the disk queue length. This indicates how many I.O. operations are queued and waiting. Typically you want this value to be low, um, certainly under 2. And then there's another one, uh, the physical disk object averages disk uh, reads and writes per second. Uh, you definitely want these values to be very low. Values of under 10 milliseconds are usually pretty good. Values of higher than 20 milliseconds could indicate a storage problem. If you're using flash storage, you'll typically see this oftentimes below uh, 2 milliseconds. Now I talked a little bit about BIOS settings. One thing, most servers come with the power settings set to uh, balanced. You don't want that in a SQL Server system. You should definitely check out your hardware BIOS settings and then and make sure you're using the high performance setting. And then Windows Server itself also has a power setting that you should check into. And this is on the control panel, go into hardware, power options. By default, this is also set to balanced. You should change this to high performance. 
Then let's talk about a few SQL Server configuration settings. Uh, first, tempdb. This is sort of a work database that's used for SQL Server for joins and a lot of other operations that it has to take care of in the background. Oftentimes, if you are experiencing page latch I.O. delays, it could be because you don't have enough data files in tempdb. Tempdb was originally, by default, a setup to use one data file. Uh, nowadays, our recommended best practice is just plain to set this to about 8. And the new SQL Server 2016-2017 setup that will take care of uh, this for you by suggesting more data files. Uh, best practice, uh, unless of course you're on flash storage and that can change things, but uh, consider separating tempdb from your other databases. And also consider putting tempdb onto, uh, onto flash storage. The, the, I.O. patterns in tempdb can benefit from flash storage. Finally, there's a few SQL Server configuration settings that you definitely should look into that can impact performance quite a bit. Uh, maximum memory setting. By default, SQL Server takes all the memory in the system. Best practice is to set this to about 90% of your total system memory, leaving about 10% or 4 gigabytes free. Next, there's the maximum degree of parallel settings. Uh, by default, this is zero, which allows SQL Server to use all the available cores during execution. A uh, best practice nowadays is typically to set this to the number of cores you might have in a single CPU. So, for instance, if you have a a dual socket system where each socket has eight cores in it, you might set this value to eight. Uh, the cost threshold for parallelism, this is how SQL Server decides when it starts to split tasks into multiple threads. This has been set this way forever. The default value is 5, which is really pretty low. A best practice is to increase this setting to about 25 to 50, depending on the type of workloads that you're having. OLTP can benefit from lower values, where OLAP can benefit from higher values. And finally, there's a Windows permission that can make a difference when SQL Server wants to uh, auto-grow databases and uh, or create new databases, and this is instant file initiation, um, initialization, I should say. And you should um, set this by granting a SQL Server the Perform Volume Maintenance tasks. Um, this is set also uh, optionally in the SQL Server 2016 and 2017 uh, setup process. Anyway, let's have a quick look at these. So here's a SQL Server VM that's running. Let's bring up um, SQL Server Management Studio and let's dig into some of the server properties and we'll find some of these settings. So first Let's look at memory, and here you can see the memory is set at the default setting. This is a, uh, a 4 gig system, so we're going to set it in at oh, 90% of the system memory, which is 3686. And then we're going to pop down and look at processors. There's nothing to change there. Security. Connections. We're going to leave that at the default. Database settings. Here, we probably should go in since this was just newly built it's using all the default locations but you should definitely go in and adjust these to run on different drives certainly separating the the data and log files for at least hdd systems that would definitely be a good idea then let's go into the advanced settings and as we go through we can see uh, looking at cost threshold for parallelism that was one of them a good idea is to change this from somewhere to from up to 5 to 25 to 50. And we'll just take the more uh, conservative approach right here. And maximum degree of parallelism. This is a system with uh, four cores per processor, so we'll set it at four. So that's our system settings. And let's not forget our system power settings. So let's go ahead and we'll open up control panel. And from control panel, we'll go to system and we'll go to hardware and then power options. And see here, the setting is set at the, the default, which is balanced. We do not want that. We're going to go ahead and set it to high performance. And there you go. Let's have a quick look at some of these settings using DPA, which makes it pretty easy to see uh, where our performance weights are coming from. And here you can see we fired off a workload, and that workload has been running for a little while. And you can see we have a couple warnings coming up right away, one in query, one in CPU. 
So let's first go ahead and drill into our CPU uh, warning. And you can see that the utilization here is pretty high. We're running at about 88%. And um, that's pretty high, so a little bit higher than we might want to look at. And if we go back, we can look at our memory utilization. Remember, there's a couple counters out there that we said were interesting. So we can drop down, hit memory, and you can see that our memory utilization is not too bad. We're up at 75%. That's, that's not too bad. We're not having a memory problem. Our buffer cat hit ratio is nearly at 100 and our buffer cache has been growing steadily. So we don't really have a, a memory issue here. So if we go back and we drill down into some of the queries that are running and we look at the query weight condition, here you can see that we are having one query in particular, this one, if we hover over it, this purchase query, and it is taking almost all the time on our system. So let's drill into that one. And here you can see that our biggest weight is in the write log. So right now we can tell that CPU, we could use a little more CPU power, memory looks okay, but our write log looks like we should move the transaction log to a faster drive and that would really help us in this situation. And that's the end of this presentation. Thank you for watching.